We're going to deal with our second of the four pre-Homeric heroes that we look at before we get into Homer. And as I told you last time, Perseus was the first of the Greek heroes. And now Heracles comes next, and he is by far the most important, the most often and seriously worshipped of all of the Greek heroes throughout Greece. All right, we talked about Demeter and Dionysus being earth deities and how they, even though Demeter is associated with Eleusis for the obvious reason that the Eleusinian mysteries were founded there, she has worship centers all over Greece and so does Dionysus. Eventually, especially once theater starts picking up all over Greece, not only in, in Athens. In the same way, Heracles is represented all over Greece as a hero worship. And so that's really important to know because there are various poles around Greece that worship not only one god or goddess, but also a hero as well. So, so some places worship only a hero, some places only a god, but sometimes a hero and a god. And when that occurs, by far the most common combination is Zeus and Heracles. Okay? And, and to make it really clear that Heracles is the Zeus of the heroes. Okay? He's the lead hero. The most famous place and important where Zeus and Heracles are both worshipped, although nominally it's more Zeus than Heracles, is at Olympia, the site of the Olympics from 776 and, and onward. Let's get right on to Heracles. And one thing I was thinking about, if you go to the bookstore or if you look at any, uh, you know, and you look at some kind of a, a mytho mythological dictionary and you get a sense of, you know, oh, so many different gods and goddesses and heroes and, you know, it seems almost random. It seems just, there's just so many. That you know, by being overwhelmed by the great number uh, and diversity of, of the heroes and gods, you can lose sight of the fact of how really simple it is to, to get a grip on the basics, on, on the essentials of myth, and, and how, and this is even more important, how interconnected they are. There's almost a kind of system to it. And when it comes to the heroes, it's the same thing. We looked at Perseus already, and now we're moving on to Heracles. When you look at most handbooks of mythology, such as Edith Hamilton mythology, very good, you know, from the 40s, um, it's pretty much the standard, you know, just telling one story after another, very rarely does the Heracles story start with the fact that Heracles is related to Perseus, okay, he a direct descendant, three generations removed, okay, and why is that important? To get across the idea for the ancient Greeks of the continuity of these heroes and also the next two heroes we're going to be looking at, Theseus and Jason, where do they fall You know, uh, when it comes to Perseus and Heracles? I'll give, give you a little spoiler. Where they fall is they are contemporaneous. They are at the same time. They're, they're living at the same time. They're contemporaries of Heracles. And the most famous representation of that fact is, as we'll see when we get to Jason, and the voyage of the Argonauts in the ship, the Argo, and we're going to get to him, we're going to spend a whole day on Jason, on that journey, which is the archetype for the Avengers, the notion of various heroes that have Im important histories of their own, yet they band together for an, a particularly challenging, at least, goal, if not set of goals. They all go together on the voyage of the Argo, Heracles, Theseus, and Jason. So starting today, the next three heroes we deal with um, all will go on the voyage of the Argo. Now, why is that important? Because that is certainly the most important and famous for the ancient Greeks of the hero quests preceding the Trojan War, pre preceding the Greeks going to Troy to fight the Trojan War. In other words, what Homer sings about. Okay, so, so it's good to understand how these things relate to each other, um, whether it be through lineage and or through simple you know, time when they lived. We ended in talking about Perseus with his saving Andromeda from the sea monster, from the Katos, from the giant whale is really what that kind of means. Takes her with him to Seraphos, to Polydectes, to turn him into stone, so that Dictus becomes the new king of Seraphos and Perseus sails away with Andromeda and founds Mycenae. It turns out that Mycenae is going to be the place where the story of Heracles begins and ends. The story of Heracles begins in Mycenae, the very place that his 
great-grandfather, Perseus, found it, and it ends there as well. Okay, so Perseus and Andromeda have two kids. They have a male and a female. If you let it be tricky, it can be, but it's not that bad. The male gets married to a mortal and has a male child, right? So their son has a son. Their daughter has a daughter with me so far. And the grandkids, who are cousins, marry, which is not that uncommon in, in each year. At least we're away from sisters and brothers and, and mothers and, you know, and all that creepy dish. Okay, that's what's going on here. Are we good so far? Because, you know, in the past when I taught this, I kind of rushed by this. And it gets confusing if you let it. So genealogical stuff is the most confusing aspect of myth. Again, if you let it be. But it doesn't have to be. So they have two kids, male and female. The male has a male, the female has a female, and they get married. It all begins with Zeus seducing a mortal woman named Io. And in order to hide the fact from Hera, and this is after the Leto thing with Apollo and Artemis, he turns Io into a cow. And then Zeus and Io have kids. And from that, um, comes other aspects of their story that are more or less interesting, but frankly not as interesting as a lot of stories. Okay, so you don't need to know Epaphus, you don't need to know Poseidon plus Libya equals Belus, and then from Belus comes Aegyptus, Danaios, and Cepheus. These are not that important stories. In the old days, I told all of these aspects of the story uh, to my class, and it was not really worth bothering with. The important part of this genealogy begins with Acrisius, who we dealt with in the Perseus story, for the obvious reason that he ends up being the grandfather of Perseus. So just notice that Acrisius comes down from a long line that incorporates Zeus' blood. And so Perseus is more than half divine. And we already talked about how that's not necessarily a big deal. All right? the, the idea is that if you have any mortality in you, you have to die anyway. So if you're a quarter, if you're three quarters, you have some divinity. But never do you find an example of there being a comparison of heroes between who's more divine and who isn't. You would maybe expect that there would be, right? Especially when we get to Theseus, you're going to see that the, the mini Heracles, he has just about half as much divinity as Heracles. And yeah, he has a little bit of an inferiority complex about it, but you know, there's never a, a comparison between them, despite the fact that they're contemporaries and they both go on the journey of the Argo. All right, so it begins with Acrisius, as we saw, Danaea and Zeus and Perseus, Perseus and Andromeda getting married, Electrion the female, Alcaeus the male, and then Alcmene is the daughter of Electrion, and Amphitryon is the son of Alcaeus. And it's the daughter of Electrion, in other words, the daughter of the daughter of Perseus and Andromeda, who concerns us today. We're going to get a sense of how it is that Heracles comes about. Okay, so the bottom line here to understand, and it's really important to get these details about Heracles' birth for various reasons. First of all, Heracles being the most important hero, intrinsically it's important. But second of all, when we get to Theseus next time, it's important that we will compare the birth of each of them and similarities and differences between them. So the idea is Amphitryon is off on some kind of trip and he's away for a while. And Zeus comes along and rather than looking through a portal, as in the case of Danaea, right? Not looking through some window or portal and seeing her from a distance, but rather actually going in disguised as none other because this is the usual thing that, that gods do, uh, and goddesses, when they want to encounter mortals for whatever reason, they disguise themselves as human beings. Okay? Sometimes animals, but those are pretty much the two. And then every once in a while, Zeus will surprise you by becoming a cloud or something else. But usually it's one of those two things. And in this case, it's kind of interesting that not just any old human is Zeus disguised as. He's disguised as Amphitryon himself. Okay? the husband of Alcmena. So that's what happens. So Amphitryon is gone. Zeus comes in, seduces Alcmena. Alcmena thinking it's her husband. They have sex. And then Zeus splits. And then guess what? Amphitryon comes back home. And he's all raring to go. He's been gone for a while. And he's interested in having sex with Alcmena. Alcmena's all like, whoa. You know, like kind of surprised. You know, hey, we just did it. Oh, yeah. If today you're especially full of them and vigor, let's, let's do it. And they do. They have sex, quote, again, unquote. Hera plays a trick on Zeus once she finds out that he impregnated um, Alcmena and that she was going to have a kid with her. Now, this is the most obscure detail of the story. Hera convinces Zeus to promise that on the day that Alcmena gives birth, the future king of Mycenae will be born. Now, what Zeus takes that to mean, Zeus assumes that he is pulling a trick on Hera 
whereas it's the other way around. Hera, by saying that, knows that Zeus thinks that that means that his son is going to end up being the one who gets to be king because he knows when Alcmena is about to give birth and it just so happens when Hera says when someone's born on this day that on that day the king, uh, future king of Mycenae will be born. What Zeus doesn't know is that at the exact same time the guy who will eventually be Zeus's cousin is not born yet either. His name's Eurystheus and there's kind of a race for which one is going to be born. Heracles or Eurystheus. Hera knows this. And so when Hera says to Zeus, promise me that on the day Alcmena gives birth, the future king of Mycenae will be born, Zeus promises, and Hera knows that it's so close between Heracles and Eurystheus that all that it requires her to do is to delay the birth of Heracles and expedite the birth of Eurystheus, the eventual cousin of Heracles, and that will establish the other guy instead of Heracles to be the future king of Mycenae. And when Eurystheus is born before Heracles, then it's ordained in the cosmos that it's Eurystheus, the cousin, rather than Heracles, who will be the king of Mycenae. Okay? Now that's going to be a big deal later on in the story when it turns out that Eurystheus, the king of Mycenae, is the guy that Heracles is going to have to answer to when he does certain things that cause him to have to pay retribution for what he has done that was bad. Okay, so that just keep in mind, Eurystheus is over there once they're grown up in Mycenae as the king. And the events leading up to that will make clear why Eurystheus came into the story in the first place. Okay, Eurystheus is king of Mycenae because Hera played a trick on Zeus. That's the bottom line, right? And then what happens? Here is the key. Here's the important detail to get. And again, this was a sticky point in the old days for classes because we didn't linger over it enough. What happens is this. There are two different fathers who have two twins. Each of the twins has a different father. Each of the twins has the seed right, of one of the two males, whether it be Zeus or whether it be Amphitryon. Got me? So they both had sex with Alcmena. They're going to be two twins as a result. It's not where they both have one father and Alcmena. One has one father, the other has another. Now that's going to be really important. When we get to Theseus, we're going to compare. It's going to be different. It's going to be different in an interesting way. Okay, so just keep that in the back of your mind. Now the interesting thing is, once these twins are born, here comes lack of logic and myth. Hera doesn't know which is which. Hera needs to find out which one is the son of Zeus as opposed to the son of Amphitryon. Why? So she can kill him. Right? Hera hates the offspring of Zeus because it's the only way she can get at Zeus. And it's a light motif. That means a recurring theme that occurs throughout the trajectory of stories dealing with Hera. Okay? And it's it's something you can't underestimate. And it's and yes, of course it must be a reflection of the idea of um, Hera always pretty much being known in relation to how she acts towards Zeus more than as in a personality in her own right. Okay? Um, unlike Athena. Right? Athena, thank gosh for Athena. All right? But Hera, you know, for the most part is a reflection of Zeus's amorous encounters with mortals and immortals other than herself. And the only way she can get back at him is to punish him indirectly. And that's going to ring a bell later, by the way, when we get to Jason and the aftermath of, of the voyage of the Argonauts, uh, what happens with him and, and Medea, if you ever heard of Medea. So that's going to provide a nice little foreshadowing for that. And if that doesn't mean anything, don't worry. If it does, you're welcome. Okay, so we'll, we'll get to that later on. But the bottom line here is that Hera needs to find out which is which. And the way she does it is to throw serpents into the crib with the twins and to see which one of them goes after the serpents, at least in order to try to F him up, okay? Assuming that he's going to be killed anyway, though, because he's an infant, for gosh sakes, okay? Yeah, he's the son of Zeus, but as an infant, come on. He can't defeat these giant serpents that you throw into the crib, right? Wrong. One of the twins does indeed fight with the serpents, and one of the twins kills the serpents, okay? And so now Hera knows which one is the Zeus born, and from that moment on, more than any other of the offspring of Zeus, and there are many, okay, just Wikipedia, Zeus's children. <laughs> goes on and on and on. We can spend a whole semester 
on half of his children, and then another semester on the other half. Okay, it just goes on and on. No other Olympian is that true for. Poseidon is in second place, probably. Who happens to be the father of Theseus, our next hero. So she knows, and now from this point on, she's going to do all she can to destroy him. One way Hera, in addition to the snakes, tries to you know, screw with Heracles is uh, coming up. But before that, in order to get across the character of Heracles, there is a mythical tradition, and don't forget there are all kinds of these stories, and I'm trying to tie them together. There's not one source for these heroes. So the most important stories that, that figure most prominently in various authors are the ones that I'm focusing on, and here's one of them, an early instance of Heracles' nature. Just to point out that even though he's, you know, legitimately a great hero, certainly different than kind of the, you know, ridiculous character that Hollywood portrays him as, nevertheless, he's not perfect and he does have a temper. And that comes out primarily in the story of him and his tutor named Linus. And Linus, among other things, is teaching Heracles music. And Linus tells Heracles, you're really good at a lot of subjects, but you really suck at music. And Heracles ices him. Okay, it's a simple story. But what does it show? It shows that he's capable of killing. He's capable of losing his temper and causing disproportionate damage to someone, right, if he wishes to. Why is that important? Because the most important thing about him that leads up to his 12 labors that we all have heard of at least, right, is going to have to do with violence on his part, but violence that he himself is not responsible for. Do 100% to something that Hera did to him. You see? And so it makes it that much more powerful to have this Linus story in the backdrop, to know that if he wished to, he was capable of effing up others and killing them um, out of being an idiot. Okay, an a-hole. There's no justification for his killing of Linus. That is a, a good illustration. Once, once what we're about to talk about now occurs, it makes it that much more poignant that he had absolutely no responsibility. Okay, so now Megara, just like in the Disney movie, is the name of Heracles' first wife. And she is the princess of Thebes. So now we travel from Mycenae to Thebes. And they have three kids. Now we have another example besides the snakes in the crib of Hera trying to sabotage Heracles. Get ready, we're gonna have another really big one coming up as well. Okay, so that's the first one. Now we have the second one, and that is what I just mentioned. Hera throws into Heracles' brain a entity, kind of a, a, a reified deity of sorts, called Ate, A-T, and really, in ancient Greek, it's an eta, which is kind of the equivalent of an e with a long mark over it. So it's not eight, ate. It's not eight as much as it's ate, ate. Okay, and the e is really a, an eta, if you know what that means. But um, it's it's one of the long vowels in Greek. Ate. Okay. What is ate? Ate is ate. Okay. There's no one word for it, but one decent translation of it would be confusion confusion. Throws confusion into his brain. Throws Ate okay, into his brain, which is just a, a, a um, energy, a state of mind that causes you to be insane. It drives Heracles insane. And it leads him to slaughter his wife and three kids. And killed the wife and the kids. So now Heracles having done this, and this raises the whole question of responsibility, is Heracles guilty of it? No, unequivocally. Ate is more powerful than the will, than the decision-making capacity of a mortal. It's very unequivocal. There's no in-between. 100% he's not responsible, according to the myth that we're talking about. Nevertheless, Heracles takes responsibility for it. And he feels totally, obviously horrible about it, not only intrinsically, in the sense of he killed his family, for gosh sakes, but also feels guilty for it. Hera comes to him. He doesn't know that she threw the Ate into his head, so as for all he knows, she's on the up and up with him, and she tells him what he needs to do in order to atone for murdering his family. What he has to do is go to the Oracle of Delphi and find out what he needs to do. Now, right away, this should remind us of the Perseus story. 
because Perseus needed to go to one group of people in order to find out where to find the other group of people. In this case, Heracles is going to the Oracle Delphi. Why? He doesn't know yet. But when he gets there, he's going to realize that, oh, now you need to go to another person. So it's an interesting structural similarity insofar as we want to compare the different myths, the Perseus myth with the Heracles myth. Okay? All right. So he does. He goes to Delphi, which right away rings another bell. Because don't forget, Acrisius went to the oracle to find out you know, whether he would have a male issue and found out that he has to make sure that his daughter doesn't have any kids. That darn oracle keeps on coming up in all these stories, not only of the heroes, but also all the way back to Uranus, Cronus, and Zeus. So he goes to Delphi to find out what he needs to do. He petitions the oracle of Delphi, and the oracle of Delphi tells him that he needs to go to Mycenae and do whatever the king of Mycenae tells him to do. Oh, whoa, hang on. King of Mycenae is Eurystheus, the guy who Hera expedited the birth of so that he would be the king of Mycenae rather than Heracles. Sounds fishy, doesn't it? There's a good reason for it. This is the most famous example in all of myth of doctoring the Oracle of Delphi. Guess who was behind the Oracle? Hera. Corruption. <laughs> all right. Very interesting. I told you guys how myth ties into real life and politics and this and that, all right? So you have absolute unequivocal corruption going on here. Hera is behind the corruption of the Pythia delivering the oracle to Heracles that he needs to go to Mycenae. And Hera knows just as much as Eurystheus, who is waiting for Heracles to get to Mycenae, exactly what Heracles is going to find when he gets there. And that is Eurystheus has a list of 12 things Heracles needs to accomplish in order to atone for the murder of his family. All right, let's pause there for a second, you guys. So wait a minute. Those famous 12 labors of Heracles that we all know about, his having to accomplish them has nothing whatsoever to do with him in terms of his character, who he is, what kind of guy he is, right? It has everything to do with what? On the one hand, it has to do with Hera making him go crazy, but on the other hand, another way of looking at it from a standpoint of Heracles in a really positive sense, it has to do with Heracles taking on responsibility for something that wasn't his responsibility. Now, why would that be? First of all, he doesn't know, like I told you, that Hera put the Ate into his head. So as far as he's concerned, he is responsible for it. That's tragedy, right, man, right? This is, Heracles is the first tragic hero, okay? Perseus isn't a tragic hero at all. It's a very simple story. Perseus goes out to kill the monster and kills the monster. It's very simple. It's the paradigmatic hero quest story. Then it gets complicated with Heracles because of all the psychological stuff and all this, all these issues of responsibility. Unlike Perseus, where there's not that much depth, you know, it's pretty much a guy who goes out and he has to kick some ass. Now he's intelligent. He has to use his intelligence in order to look at the thing and not, not look directly at it or whatever. But when it comes to Heracles, it has more to do than having divinity in you. It has to do with complexity. It has to do with what kind of person you are and what you become because of your experiences. And that has a lot to do with why Heracles is by far the most important of the heroes, because of his complexity and because of the suffering. And that's what I meant by the, the tragedy thing. Okay, Heracles is the first tragic figure in, in Greek narrative um, because of all the issues he's experiencing. He will never know what Hera did to him. He will never know that she rigged all this. Okay, this is third person stuff. This is separate from Heracles. It's not a first person thing where you're looking through his eyes in this whole narrative. You're you're looking at this poor guy experiencing these things against his will and against his knowledge. Okay, and that's what makes him such an interesting guy, but also what makes him such an important hero. When he goes on his 12 labors in order to do what he has to do according to the Oracle of Delphi, which according to him is the oracle speaking directly to him without any corruption whatsoever from Hera or anyone else. When he goes out to start his labors and he accomplishes one after another successfully, okay, as far as he's concerned, he is doing what he has to do in order to atone for the guilt that only we, right, from a distance know that he shouldn't have, but he does. He has the guilt because he doesn't know that the reason for it has to do with corruption on the part of Hera and deception on the part of Hera. He thinks it's because of him. Hey, that's a message not only in hero stories in general, and because I, I told you that most of the tellings of these come later, and so it's not any one particular authority we can depend on, but also Greek tragedies in particular. Greek tragedy is all about, especially Oedipus the king, right? this idea of fate 
taking people in directions that as far as they know, with their myopic vision, you know, they only know a, a small, if any, amount of why they are doing what they have to do and why they're suffering what they have to suffer. And then you pull back the camera and there's this cosmic reason for things, that the one who suffers these things, the tragic hero, is quite often absolutely in the dark about. That's why Heracles is the first tragic hero, right? And that's why he's used quite often in tragedies in ancient Greece. All right, so now all there is to do, once we get to this part of the story, it's all about the, the 12 labors. So what can we say about them? Okay, I would say that the, the biggest takeaway from those different labors is to pay attention to the difference between them when it comes to what sort of resources Heracles had to muster within himself in order to accomplish them. Okay, So the very first one, for good reason, very symbolically, the first of his 12 labors, is the one of the Nemean lion. In the area of Nemea, which for our purposes, geographically, we don't have to worry, it's on the Greek mainland, bottom line, where you can actually go and visit right now and get some really good wine called the Blood of Heracles. It might have been the best wine I ever had in my life. Anyway, what's the important thing about the Nemean lion? It's a test of Heracles' brute strength. It doesn't have to do with much in the way of ingenuity. That'll be number two and, and onward. Okay, so when it comes to what the Nemean lion challenge or, or labor requires of Heracles, it requires him to kill a lion that no one else is able to kill, who has been terrorizing the countryside for years and years with his bare hands. First, a bow and arrow is shot at him like everybody else tries to do. And the lion is so powerful and so strong, the arrows bounce off. The arrows are absolutely unable to, to penetrate the body of, of the uh, lion. And so the only way Heracles is able to do it is unlike any other person or hero who has tried in the past, and not many did, he's able to overcome the lion with his bare hands. And then once he does so, he takes the claws of the lion and skins the lion and takes the headdress and the hide of the lion and wears it as his costume. You know, okay, that's a powerful moment there that you can see if someone makes a decent movie of Heracles, that would be the moment, right? That would be the, the um, sword and sandals under the rock for our next guy, Theseus. Okay, that's that moment. You know, there's a, there's a moment. There's a, there's a real kind of seminal moment for each of the, you know, obviously the Medusa um, decapitation would be the big one for Perseus. In this case, the symbol of Heracles becomes the lion headdress. And from this point on, they're inseparable. No less than the thunderbolt for Zeus and the trident for Poseidon. Okay? That's how you know that you're dealing with Heracles from now on in art. Is he's wearing the headdress. In the historical period, because I always like to try to make ties between mythology and the real world, Alexander the Great, you might have heard of him, in certain of his coins, wears a lion's head dressed just like Heracles, thereby not so subtly associating himself with Heracles the hero, seeing himself as the Heracles of the future of Greece in the face of the Persian Empire to the east, who the Athenians 250 years earlier had claimed to have defeated you know, in the Persian Wars, but Alexander the Great said, no, nah, it's not quite over yet, and we need to take uh, all of Greece with us. We won't destroy you guys, but we will ask you to join with us to go to the east and to finish the job that you supposedly finished 250 years ago. And in order to convince the rest of Greece that he is the one for the job, what better way than to use an icon or an avatar, as we might say, that is reminiscent of by far the most powerful symbol of the unification of Greece than Heracles. Zeus is the only other one that would compare in that respect. Right, but especially Heracles, because of what we talked about, about how heroes are more relatable to human beings than the gods. Okay, there's no better, no more important symbol. Now, the second of his labors, we're not going to go through all of them with the same amount of attention, but the second one is also very important. It's also important that it is second after the first. The first one has to do with testing the brute strength of Heracles. We talked about Ares, Athena, and how Ares is all about brute strength. Athena is about strategy. That's not to say that when you're a hero, brute strength isn't important. It is to say that you must not exaggerate its importance at the expense of ingenuity and the expense of strategy. Okay? The strength that Ares represents, what's bad about it is not that, it, that he's so strong and that he's so into fighting. It's that that's his exclusive mindset. 
It's all about just kicking ass. That's bad, you know, when it's not tempered by what Athena has. Heracles needs to incorporate those two things within himself. Just as Mars does when Ares is brought from Greece into Rome in the form of Mars. And then he starts getting more respect because he takes on the strategic properties of Athena. And Minerva, the Roman equivalent to Athena, starts taking on the more wisdom goddess aspects of what Athena was in Greece. So the Lernian Hydra is a many-headed serpent. And the idea here is to come up with a way to keep it from growing to such unmanageable proportions that it completely destroys the world. Because what happens is when you cut off one of its heads, at first you think you're a big deal for doing that, and that's great. But the problem is two heads grow where one head was. The exponential growth of the head can become a horrible thing that can take over an entire territory. So how does Heracles take care of the Larian Hydra? He has to come up with a way to do so that requires not brute strength, but ingenuity. Okay, and so that's the idea of the second labor. It, it illustrates the ingenuity of Heracles, the intelligence. And why is that going to be an important distinction to make? Because you're looking ahead to Homer. In Homer, that distinction becomes very important when you're talking about the difference between Achilles and Odysseus. There are going to be two epics by Homer, the Iliad and the Odyssey. The Iliad is pretty much about Achilles, and what he's known as is being by far the most powerful and best fighter of all of the Greeks, all of the Trojans, anyone in the world. Okay, almost as stronger and more powerful and, and a better fighter um, and warrior than, than any other in the world as Zeus is over all the other gods and goddesses in Olympus. And that's big. Zeus, in one famous passage of the Iliad, talks about how if he had a cord of gold with all the other Olympians on the other end of it, he could pretty much swing them around with one finger. That's how much more powerful Achilles is than any other, uh, the other heroes. That would be the Nemean lion labor. You know, that's kind of the Achilles, Achilles would have kicked ass on that one. Okay? But then the Larian Hydra one is a test that would require the ingenuity of the most intelligent of the Greek heroes who went to Troy. And that would be Odysseus, as we'll see. The Larian Hydra tests the ingenuity of Heracles in a way that is a kind of foreshadowing of the difference between the way that Achilles and Odysseus are compared by Homer. And that among other things, justifies Homer devoting an entire 12,000-plus line epic to Odysseus. Okay, so you have a, an epic for Achilles, an epic for Odysseus, in a way that's having an epic for the guy who would really kick ass in the first labor of Heracles and the guy who would really kick ass in the second labor of Heracles. All right? More tie-ins between all this stuff. You learn, so what does Heracles do? Instead of doing what everybody else does and cutting off one of the heads after another. He cuts off a head and then right away cauterizes it or burns the stump and prevents it from growing anymore by doing so. And he does that with all the arms until the hydra is completely armless. And that destroys the hydra in effect because it has no way to do any damage anymore. Okay, so that's his first ingenuity labor. Then we get to some boring ones. Okay, and I think I make jokes even in the, in the book about some of these are just kind of relatively boring. You know, not very famous for good reason, okay? The Cernian deer, Artemis wants him to return it, and he does. Okay, goodbye. Is that fun? All right, so whatever. Okay, some of these are whatevers, as it will be the case with Theseus as well. Okay, it doesn't necessarily require anything other than him going and doing it. So that's more of a busy kind of labor. So far, the Nemean lion and the hydra are the most important for us to bother with. Aramanthian boar, not important at all. Except for this really famous vase that you guys might find funny. He goes and captures the Aramanthian boar, which no one else can do, and then he brings it back to Mycenae to prove that he accomplished the labor, and none other than <laughs> Eurystheus himself is hiding in a giant vase when he gets to Mycenae, assuming that Heracles is out to get him for half sending him on all these horrible labors, and he hides in his vase, and Heracles knows that, he, knows that he's hiding it, so Heracles goes, and throws the Aramanthian boar at Eurystheus. All right, doesn't kill him or anything, but hurts him badly. So Heracles is pissed. Okay, this is a good one. This is an important one. This is one that was actually featured on an official stamp in, in Greece. The Augean stables, named after Augeus, the name of the owner of a ranch, who has a bunch of stables, a bunch of horses and stables, and horses in the stalls. And the horses in the stalls do the things the horses do besides eating. And they fill up with the things, that, you know, other than the food. All right? And so over time, the manure gets so unbearable 
that there's no way to clean this damn ranch, and he's about to give up. Augustus is about to give up on the. You know, there's a little bit of humor in the in the Heracles labors, right? And so um, Augustus is about to give up, and so Eurystheus assigns to Heracles to clean up the stables of Augustus, which, you know, as far as Eurystheus and slash Hera are concerned, is an impossible thing to do. So what does Heracles do? He uses his ingenuity. All right. So this is the third really important labor. And why is it important? Because he uses ingenuity. He doesn't get a shovel like everybody else and just start shoveling it up and it'll take forever to do that. What does he do? He realizes that there's a river nearby and he takes the time not to clean out the stables with a shovel, but rather use a shovel to dig a groove in the ground that will divert the river from being adjacent to Augustus's ranch to going through Augustus's ranch so that the river going through the ranch will push all the manure out of the ranch and then spread it all over the countryside and Augustus's ranch becomes clean by that process. That's ingenuity. That's coming up with an expedient, you know, using technology, if you will, in order to achieve something that uh, no one else thought of. So he's using his intelligence again, not his brute strength. Brute strength is, is Nemean lion. Learning hydra and Augean stables are ingenuity. Stymphalian birds is another ingenuity one. Very simple. These Stymphalian birds, just named after a place called Stymphalia, have these wings that fire arrows. And so what do you do? You have to get rid of these birds because they're just like the Nemean lion, causing all kind of havoc uh, in the countryside. They hide out in bushes. How are you going to get them out of there? Heracles comes up with the idea to use at that time, the equivalent of what today we would call castanets, noise-making, percussive instruments to scare the birds out of there and then to start picking them off once they leave the bushes. No one was able to get them out of the bushes before he comes with an idea to use noise to scare them away. That's not a giant deal to come up with, but it is yet another of his ingenuity labors. Okay, Cretan bull is boring. The only thing about the Cretan bull is he goes after the bull and he captures the bull, but then it gets away. But that counts because Eurystheus saw him capture it and that was good enough. But the significance of the Cretan bull getting away after Heracles captures it is this. The next hero we're looking at, Theseus, spoiler, is going to be the guy who ends up recapturing the Cretan bull and killing it. Okay, So that's a nice little tie-in between Heracles and Theseus, among several others. Horses of Diomedes, they eat human flesh, he kills them, yawn. All right, some of these labors aren't that exciting, but the ones that are are really important. Girdle of the Amazon Queen, Hippolyta, she realizes that Heracles has one of the labors to take the girdle away from her, and she says, okay, Heracles, you can have it, because he knows that he can do damage to her. But then Hera lies and says that Heracles kidnapped Hippolyta, causing the rest of the Amazons to be pissed off at Heracles, even though Hippolyta says, what are you talking about? We're buddies. So you get a little framing going on in this story. And the Amazons attack Heracles, and Heracles kicks their asses. Right? So you got the male-female fighting thing going on, that motif. All right? Amazons being the most badass of the female warriors in ancient mythology, named that because the Mazon was a breast, and ah means not. So it means without a breast. Why? Because supposedly, at least in the most famous of the etymologies of the word Amazon, they were so hardcore into their using bow and arrow in warfare that they cut off their left breast in order to facilitate shooting a bow and arrow, to better facilitate that. But Heracles wins that one. It's an okay labor, not that exciting. Cattle of Geryon, three-bodied monsters, no biggie. All right, the three-headed monsters as opposed to the Larian Hydra. In this case, he just needs to ice them. Their heads don't grow back like the Hydra, so there's no big deal. Apples of Hesperides are interesting to some extent. Hesperides are just the names of a certain type of nymph, a certain type of forest deity. And here you, you involve Zeus and Hera in the story. Zeus gave these apples that have magic properties. It was a wedding gift given to Hera, and she lost them, didn't know where they were. And so it was the task of Heracles to find out where they were. So in order to do so, and this is going to be foreshadowing of the Odyssey story as well, because Odysseus needs to go and find someone to find out where to go next in his journey, just like Perseus needed to do in order to go on his journey. Yeah, so this is, as you're getting, a, a motif, a common motif. This is the labor where Heracles has to get a hold of, and literally in this case, 
someone else in order to learn something that needs to be done. And in this case, it's Nereus, this mythical figure who changes shape. He's a shapeshifter. Okay, he's the famous shapeshifter. And he changes shape, especially if you grab him, he turns into something else that makes it easier for him, you know, like more of a liquid kind of character. So he has to get a hold of, and that in itself is a kind of labor, of Nereus in order to find out where the apples of the Hesperides are. He does so, he finds out where he needs to go, and he finds out he needs to, just like Perseus, who needed to go to the Graii, but then to the Nymphs, he has to go beyond Nereus, and he has to find Atlas. The Titan, remember the Titans? One of the Titans who fought against the Olympians and was punished for having done so by having to lift up the globe of the world, and yes, it was believed that it was a round world, has to lift up the globe of the world forever. That's Atlas's punishment for having fought against the Olympians. So he goes to Atlas, who's doing that, okay, and that's obviously where you get the name Atlas. You know, if you look at an Atlas, a book of, of maps and things like that. Um, and he gets Atlas to go, he could persuade him somehow, it's not mentioned, to go to get the apples for him. And Atlas does so, successfully, brings them back to Heracles, but then on the way back to Heracles, it occurs to him, wait a minute, I want to get credit for this, I'm bringing this stuff back to Eurystheus. Heracles knows that he can't do that and still get credit for accomplishing the labor. So Heracles uses his ingenuity, so he has to get a hold of, and that in itself is a kind of labor, of Nereus in order to find out where the apples of the Hesperides are. He does so, he finds out where he needs to go, and he finds out he needs to, just like Perseus, who needed to go to the Graii but then to the Nymphs, he has to go beyond Nereus and he has to find Atlas. The Titan, remember the Titans? One of the Titans who fought against the Olympians and was punished for having done so by having to lift up the globe of the world, and yes, it was believed that it was a round world, has to lift up the globe of the world forever. That's Atlas's punishment for having fought against the Olympians. So he goes to Atlas, who's doing that, okay, and that's obviously where you get the name Atlas, you know, if you look at an Atlas, a book of, of maps and things like that. And he gets Atlas to go to get the apples for him. While Atlas went and got the apples, Heracles temporarily held the, the world up for him. And Atlas does so, successfully brings them back to Heracles, but then on the way back to Heracles, it occurs to him, wait a minute, I want to get credit for this. I'm bringing this stuff back to Eurystheus. Heracles knows that he can't do that and still get credit for accomplishing the labor. So Heracles uses his ingenuity in order to lie to Atlas and convince him, okay, 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 you can go get all the credit, you can go to Eurystheus, whatever, just do me a favor, hold the globe for me for just a little bit, and give me a break, and then I'll hold it again, you can go to Eurystheus. So Heracles lies to Atlas in order to accomplish the labor the way that Eurystheus ordered him to. So yeah, apples of Hesperides, the ingenuity aspect has to do with the lie to Atlas in order to uh, get credit. Okay, now we get to the last one, and pretty much my favorite, because it involves a dog, and I'm a dog freak, Cerberus, the three-headed hellhound. Now, this is another ingenuity story, and it's pretty hilarious. It's impossible to overpower the three-headed hellhound, but he has to do it somehow. But instead of doing it, and this is a very Taoist kind of, uh, you know, lesson here. You know, the idea of the yin, right? He uses his yin um, in intelligence. Instead of fighting against Cerberus, the three-headed hellhound, he, ca he captures him by putting food in front of him and feeding him. And he wags his tail and eats the food, and Heracles pets him, and from that point on, he becomes his pet. The only problem being that on the Earth, there aren't that many who are okay with the idea of this three-headed hellhound living on the Earth. And the second thing is, Hades complains to Zeus, just as he complained about not having a wife, and needing uh, Persephone to go down and live there with him. So he complains to Zeus about, I miss my doggy, especially those parts of the year when Persephone is not down here. And so Zeus orders Heracles to give him back, and, and he does. Okay, but that's the final. And yes, it's another ingenuity labor.